Welcome to the Good Christophian Talks podcast. I'm Levi. And I'm Chris. Thank you so much for joining us this week. On this podcast, we select one talk a week to help each one of us get the Bible in our daily news feed. We post at the start of each week for you to listen with a short intro beforehand to kind of set the stage for the talk you're about to hear. And now, let's hear more about this week's talk. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the Good Christadelphian Talks podcast. My name's Sam Taylor. You might know me from the Christadelphian Devotions podcast, Pause to Consider. This week and the coming week, I'll be filling in for Levi and Chris. On this week's class, we will be taking a look at the first class in a series given by Brother Ken Stiles at North Battleford, Saskatchewan Ecclesia in 2010. That series is entitled Godly Love and can be found on the ChristadelphianBibleTalks.com. In this first class, we take a look at the love of the Father, which is the most logical place for us to start when we are considering godly love. And we know this because of the passage which tells us we love because God loved us first. Brother Ken does a fantastic job in this series of weaving his way through scripture and showing how godly love is not something you're born with. It's not something you get right away. It's something that takes a lifetime of hard work and dedication and sacrifice in order to cultivate. It's done through a lot of tears, a lot of sweat and bloodshed. One of the most poignant points that Brother Ken made was how the love we should show to our brothers and sisters should not be given based on their worthiness or their merit, but rather their need. And this resonated with me a lot because I struggle with depression and anxiety and I've often found myself as being very unworthy of a lot of these things. It comes with the territory of having that false narrative that comes from mental illness in your head. But when I realized this, I realized that the brothers and sisters who show me care do so not because I feel deserving of it, but because they recognize I'm in need of it, in great need of it. And it's helped me to also show that love towards others that not because they deserve it, not because that they're acting like they want it, but because they in fact need it. So it's one of those things that you internalize it and as it's shown to you, you can show it more towards others. And that point that Brother Ken gave really resonated with me and it continues to do so even to this day. All throughout this series, you'll start with the love of the Father and then the love of the Son, and then you'll see the power of godly love, the impact it can make, and how we should behave. And it's a wonderful way to wrap up this series as we look at towards how we behave towards our brothers and sisters, because we can have all this academic knowledge of love, but without the action to follow through with it, it means nothing. I hope you get to enjoy this first class in the Godly Love series, and God willing, I'll be talking to you next week. Enjoy, and God bless. The subject that we're considering for the weekend, godly love, as we have styled it, is what we feel the uh, gospel is intended to develop within us. It's, uh, it can become, as we have found in our life, a power that is greater than sin. And, and we don't mean that in any way other than it's stated. But we all know how powerful sin can be in our life either through internal temptation or in challenging relationships or whatever the case may be. And you'll see in Scripture, from the mouth and from the lips of our Lord Jesus Christ, His declaration that the power of His love for His God, for His Father in His life, was stronger than the power of sin. We'll see that it's not the same as human love. And we will need to differentiate between the two as we progress through the studies. We'll look at examples of Bible people, faithful Bible characters, who embraced godly love as a principle by which they lived. Esther did not have godly love at the beginning of chapter 4 in the book of Esther. She had adopted and embraced godly love by the end of chapter 4. And it made a marked difference in her life and in her character. We'll look at how godly love applies to husbands and wives, to parents, to brethren and sisters in the ecclesia, and its great power for good in our relationships together. God's love can teach us to be different people because we learn to love 
like Jesus loved. It's not something that happens mystically. It's not something that happens mysteriously. But when we learn to love one another as Jesus loved us and loves us still, it will teach us to be different people. We have one quote in the handout from Brother Roberts. We like to begin with this because we found it to be very effective and very helpful in uh, summarizing the, uh, the study. And as we read through it, this is section one on the handout, and, and don't worry, we won't get through all the sections of the handout over the weekend, but again, we've left you with what we have found to be helpful in our study. So for the parts that we're not able to, uh, to cover, you can at least take those with you. As we read through the quote, notice how he stresses the importance of love and secondly, the danger we face in leaving it out of our life. There can be nothing more certain, he says, than that the sentiment of love is at the very bottom of the whole scheme of the truth in which we rejoice. There can be nothing more certain than that the very object of the truth is to manifest God's love to us and to develop God's love in us. There can be nothing more certain than that the truth in its ultimate and eternal development, as we might say, will present the very highest form of this impulse of love. And there can be nothing more certain either than that those who are not carried along by this prevailing impulse, which originates the truth, and which we may also say is the essence of the truth, will be left behind. God is love, and it is only in proportion as we remember this that we shall become capable of reflecting this quality. We must remember the whole of the truth, and not a part only. We must not leave out the love. This is our danger. We are not likely to leave out anything else. We see from the Bible that God is angry with the wicked, that corrupt and sinful human nature is nothing in his sight, that Jesus will be manifested to destroy the sinners of mankind, and that there is no salvation except in God's appointed way. We see the necessity of placing ourselves in opposition to the corruption around us and are forced into a continual attitude of defense and attack. Therefore, we are not liable to forget our duty in these things, but we are liable to forget that God is love, and that the whole truth is but the exemplification and expression of it. What we find in Scripture, and we'll see as we go through the classes, is that the pinnacle of what the truth is intended to lead us to is God's love. All of our doctrines, our Bible readings and Bible study, our singing, our prayers, our joint fraternal weekends, our trials and suffering, our ecclesial activities, even our baptism is all intended and designed to lead us to God's love. It's why Jesus died on the cross. It's why the Bible has been left on record for us. All of it is intended to bring us to the point where we are developing God's love in our life. And we see that he is at work to develop his love within us. And the outcome of his love at work in our life and as we develop his love in our life, is it provides for us a new heart that will transform our character. Again, referring to the handout at number two, the first thing to note about godly love is that it doesn't happen naturally. It's not something we're born with. It's something that must be learned. It must be developed within us. And it isn't learned without much heartache. It asks a 130-year-old father to slay his son whom he loves as a test of his faith. It asks another father to live with grief for 20 years over the apparent death of his beloved son. It asks a prophet, a husband, to refrain from mourning over the death of his wife, whom God acknowledged was the desire of his eyes. It strikes family tragedy and bodily affliction into a blameless and upright man. A man, Scripture says, was one who feared God and eschewed evil. There was none like him in all the men of the East. On three separate occasions, God's love causes a mother from Bethlehem to stand over the gravesite of her husband and her two sons in Moab. It responds to the refusal, the faithful refusal of a 90-year-old man to bow down to the head of the Jews' enemies, 
by permitting a death sentence to be passed upon the entire community of believers. And it then asks a queen of a vast empire to lay down her life for her people. In the New Testament, it permits the Jewish persecutors to cause havoc in the life of an apostle in city after city after city as he tries to preach the gospel to to save those who are in darkness. And then God's love leaves him in prison for two whole years when he could have been out preaching and witnessing. Finally, God's love asks the beloved son in whom he was well pleased to lay down his life, and to submit himself to a public crucifixion. Brethren and sisters and young people, this is the love of God. It's all done out of love, out of a desire on his part to save those whom he loved, to teach them to walk by faith in the midst of their suffering, and to love him in response to the trials that he brought into their life. It was designed to keep them from being overcome by sin, or if they were already overcome by sin, to rescue them from that situation. But don't just see the suffering of the people we've listed there. Recognize the wisdom of our God. Look at all the good that came out of these afflictions, the eternal promises that came out of the situation with Abraham the redemption of a family in the case of Naomi, the redemption of an entire generation in the case of Mordecai and Esther, and the redemption of an entire race in the case of our Lord Jesus Christ. If if we were to ask each of these faithful men and women about the love of God, about the wisdom of his love, each of them would tell us that God is right And God is wise in how he loves us. And they would echo the sentiment that we not turn to sin in the midst of our trials that he brings into our life. They would encourage us to trust his love, to embrace his love, to learn to reflect his love, and make it the love that we reflect in our life. Because it is the way to life, the way to life eternal. It's important to recognize and identify up front what love is, especially when you hear the concept of love used so uh, abundantly in the world today. For the purposes of our study, we are going to use God's definition of love. We're going to use the Bible's definition of love and how it defines love. And we will differentiate it from time to time between it and human love. And it can be a bit confusing at times because we see God's love on the one hand and we see human love on the other hand. And sometimes they can be confusing and almost appear to be the same. They are not. They come from a different source and they direct a person's actions in a different direction. And we'll see, uh, we'll see ample evidence of that. The, the definition in, in, the, in the way that we would uh, summarize it It is not one-dimensional. It involves all of the 12 aspects that we have listed under number three and and likely more. We're just trying to demonstrate the fact that godly love cannot simply be summarized by a a single term or a, a single sentence. When you take all of the verses in Scripture which speak of God's love and godly love and you put them together, this is just a simple summary of 12 aspects of it. And again, there's likely, likely more. First and foremost, the one we know well is it's a self-sacrificing love. It's a putting the needs of others before our own kind of love. And others first, not me first, love. Because he laid down his life, John writes in 1 John 3.16, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Secondly, it's obedience to God's commandments. If you love me, Christ says, you will keep my commandments. It's done from faith. It springs from faith. In Galatians 5 and 6, Paul writes, faith is working through love. You see, if faith is not at the foundation of what we are doing, when we think we are showing love, 
then it is not godly love that we are showing to another person. If it is not springing or arising from faith, we may be doing them a lot of good, but it isn't godly love. Trusting that God will take care of us if we obey him, that he will bring us through the various trials we may be in. And and the wonder of godly love and how it's connected with faith is that we continue to trust him regardless how vulnerable a situation this might put us in and, and how difficult and how much more difficult our situation might become. Oftentimes, for those who learn to love with the love of God, their situation actually became more difficult and more stressful and the trials were heaped further upon them because of the fact that they were showing and reflecting godly love in their life. Because of Joseph's love for his brethren, in chapter 37, his life will become increasingly more difficult in subsequent chapters. Because of Ruth's love for Naomi, her life will become increasingly more difficult. The same with Nehemiah, the same with Mordecai, and there's others that we could recall. Number four, it's done in hope of a future reward. Hebrews 6 says that we should remain diligent in our love for the saints in full assurance of the hope that we have. It's done not because a person deserves our love. And this is when you begin to see how godly love is so different than human love. Godly love does not, is not extended because a person deserves our love, but because a person needs our love and what it brings to their situation. We don't deserve God's love. We were sinners, as Romans 5 tells us, and enemies when God loved us and Christ died for us. So God's love is not something we earn. It's not something we're entitled to, as we know. God's love is something we need. And if we didn't have it, we'd be lost. So when a person is in need, we don't ask the question, do they deserve this? The question we ask is, do they need this? It doesn't matter what they've done. Not godly love. And if they need that, that's what the Lord says we should give to. When a brother or sister is overcome by sin, whether it's because of despair or temptation or wrong doctrine or whatever the situation may be, What they need us to bring into their situation is God's love to help rescue them from that situation. That's not human love. That's godly love. It's giving to the need of a brother or sister, whatever it might be. Deuteronomy 15 and 1 Corinthians 8 verse 9 speak of giving based upon their need, not our surplus. If we're giving to others based upon our surplus and what we have left over when our needs are taken care of, we will see that is not godly love. That is human love. It requires our total involvement, our total commitment. And we recall this as being the first commandment that Christ spoke of in summarizing this subject. It requires all our heart, all our soul, all our strength, and all our mind. So godly love is not something that we do or show periodically, but in every situation in our, in our life. There is never a conversation I should have with my wife without bringing godly love into that conversation. Now, I'm not saying I do that every time, and I certainly don't want to leave you with the mistaken impression that I stand before you as someone who has perfected this subject, because I haven't. But these are the spiritual ideals, the standards that God is calling us to. And we're going to see he doesn't just give us these standards and say, what do you think? Pick out one or two. We will see that it is God's expectation that we develop his love in us. It is the expectation of the Lord Jesus Christ that we develop his love in us. So I should never have a conversation with my 15-year-old son at home, regardless of what he has done, regardless of how shaming his actions have been to me and to my reputation, whatever my reputation might be. 
I should never interact with him in any way without bringing God's love into that situation. And that's what it means, in my mind, to love God with all our heart, all our soul, our strength, and our might. The second commandment, we are to do for our neighbor as we would like to have done for us. Now, this principle of loving your neighbor as yourself can be a bit confusing. Some people think it means, well, I need to learn to love myself before I can learn to other people. That is not what the Lord Jesus Christ was teaching. When he says we need to love our neighbor as ourselves, he says, take a look at the situation that your neighbor is in and put yourself in that situation. And then ask yourself, if I was in that situation, what would I need? And he uses the principle, as we know, of the Good Samaritan. He was attacked by thieves. And the Good Samaritan came along and bound up his wounds and poured out oil and wine. And then he sent him, he set him on his, on his beast. And, and the Good Samaritan walked while the man who was wounded rode on the beast. And then he stayed with him that night in the inn. And he got up the next day and he took care of the bill and he asked the innkeeper to keep looking after this individual. See, whatever needs the Good Samaritan had that day when he was walking along the road, whatever needs he had, immediately became of secondary importance to him. Because here was a neighbor lying in a ditch. And he asked himself, if I was in that situation, what would I need? for someone to come along and do for me. And we can begin to see the power of godly love at work in our life when we begin to see that the needs of others, if we are loving with God's love, can take on that type of importance in our life. Matthew 7, verse 12, which we won't take the time to look up, says, Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. See, godly love is what the law and the prophets were intended to bring a person to. Matthew 22, verse 40, says, On these two commandments, after Jesus had summarized the first great commandment and the second great commandment, he says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Romans 13, verse 10, as we know, says love is the fulfillment of the law. That's why we say it is the pinnacle of what discipleship is intended to bring us to. And that is true both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Godly love is done as a servant, not a master, as we see in Galatians 5, verse 13. Through love, be servants of one another. Galatians 5 says it restrains us, it present, prevents us from engaging in wrong conduct. And then it also constrains us, it compels us, according to 2 Corinthians 5.14, to right conduct. It provides a proper balance between insisting upon right doctrine and conduct while being careful not to offend in matters of conscience. So when we come to 2 John... And the Ecclesia there had a misunderstanding of love. They were under the impression that love teaches that we should accept all brethren and fellowship all brethren regardless of their beliefs. And John writes and he says, you misunderstand God's love. You are wrong to welcome and fellowship all brethren regardless of their beliefs. That is not godly love to wink at error. In 1 Corinthians 8, when Paul was talking about meat offered to idols, no, idols don't exist. But if my eating meat offered to idols will cause my brother to sin to the point of losing his salvation, Paul says it is godly love not to eat of that meat. So in matters of conscience that could cause my brother or sister to lose their way, even though an idol doesn't exist, godly love will not eat of that meat. And lastly, James 2 says it does good to all. It is careful not to show partiality. In Scripture, then, godly love is portrayed in a preeminent position. It's all-encompassing, all facets of our discipleship. All that we do is to be done in love. We know in Colossians 3 that 
Both Paul and Peter speak of its preeminence. Above all things, Paul writes, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. 1 Peter 4, verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. Be sober, Peter writes, watch unto prayer. Above all, have fervent love one for another, which covers a multitude of sins. 1 Corinthians 13, we know most of what we'll hear this weekend, we've heard before. We're just trying to put it together in a way that that can impress upon our minds what God is trying to teach us. It, it, full, it holds a, a threefold place, a, a threefold foundation in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13 with, with faith and hope. But Paul writes, the greatest of these is love. Brother Thomas wrote, it was greatest because it includes hope. It hopes all things. And it includes faith because it believes all things. So to summarize godly love as simply being a self-sacrificing love, hopefully you can see is a bit too simplistic. It's a bit too limiting. We really need all of the pieces. And again, that's not all of the pieces on that list of 1 to 12. But it's it's a good start. For for example, agape love, you know, the self-sacrificing love, is a big part of godly love. And we don't want to diminish that at all. But it's not the only part. The filial love, the love of brethren, the love of a husband for his wife, the love of children. They're all different words for love. And they're all parts of godly love. Which is why in John 5, verse 20, it says that God had filial love for, the, for his son. And in John 3, verse 35, it says God had agape love for the Lord Jesus Christ as well. In John 11, Christ has both filial and agape love for, for Lazarus. In John 16, Christ said that God had filial love for the twelve. Then he turns around in in chapter 14 at verse 23 or a couple chapters earlier where he says God had agape love for them. And and in that section of John in chapter 14 and 16 at that crucial night when this is the last night with the Lord Jesus Christ, he's not telling them in chapter 16 when he says God had filial love for uh, for the 11 actually, that this was somehow a diminished form of love. He doesn't have the highest form of love for you. He's got a diminished form of love for you. What we learn in Scripture is that all of these pieces of God's love are important. And we really need to put all the pieces together. 1 Peter 1 verse 22 says we need to have a sincere or an unfeigned filial love for our brethren. But also to agape them, one another, earnestly from the heart. Now we mentioned it's important to differentiate between godly love and human love or natural love, how the world defines love. In Philippians 1 verse 9, it says, Godly love can only arise from a proper understanding of the truth by a mind enlightened in God's will and purpose. We won't go there, but you can use it as a reference. Godly love springs from the Word. It's the principles of the Word put in action. It doesn't come naturally. If all of these young kids we have here this weekend, if our, as parents, we don't sit down to teach them about God's love, they are not going to learn it all by themselves. It's something that has to be taught. It has to be learned. It, its fundamental purpose, godly love, is to turn a person from iniquity. Either iniquity we have already committed or iniquity we would commit if left to ourselves. Godly love hates sin. It hates sin because it knows that that situation will not lead a person to righteousness. And this is where godly love and human love separate. Human love based on humanism is, is a love of man without God. So that the human love, the natural love, is what we're born with. It's what's innate in the the flesh of all of us. It's the principles of the flesh put into action. It's not intended. It's not based. Its outcome is not a desire to turn a person from sin. Human love is intended to make people feel good. To make people feel loved. To make people feel important. And it's a reciprocating love. So I love you with human love, and my anticipation or expectation is you will turn around and love me so I can feel good. 
And it's a manipulative type of love. I will love you because I'm with human love because I'm hoping that somehow you're going to do something for me. That is not godly love. At times, godly love can look like human love. And in those times, it can be a bit confusing because it has the appearance of righteousness. It even encourages people to do good things. But it encourages them to do things that are outside what God defines as the boundaries of righteousness. So with human love, you have all kinds of sin being tolerated, even promoted, in the name of human love. Christianity is losing sight of godly love as it increasingly blends ever more human love with godly love. And it ends up with a mixture, part truth and part error. It ends up teaching that God is an all-loving God and that he will forgive all and he will accept all and he will save all because of his all-lovingness. That's human love. That's not godly love. They're even redefining love to accept alternative lifestyles. So that homosexuality is finding an ever-increasing presence in society and in the churches. It's redefining the role of women in the churches to give them an increasingly important positions of leadership. That the scripture says is not for theirs to have because of God's wisdom. If you follow current events, you'll know that the Episcopalians and the Methodists in North America are moving in this direction. The, the Church of Canada 20 years ago ca- crossed the the homosexual bridge in allowing that way of life into their community. But from the world's perspective, it is seen as a better love. It's a more encompassing love. It's a more compassionate love. They will even try to defend it as being a more a superior love than what the scriptures speak of. So that both society and Christianity are gradually moving away from the first commandment. That's what's happening. They are stressing the need for love to do good to your neighbor without the first commandment, which defines what righteousness is. And when you take the first commandment out of the picture, the need to love God as he defines righteousness and to obey him with all our heart and soul and strength and mind, when you take that piece out and all you have left is we need to do good to all men, what you end up with is all kinds of sin now being accommodated. And people actually believe that is a superior form of love. The second commandment without the first, a love that is void of the righteousness of God, may give people a sense of goodness, but it will not lead anyone to righteousness. And there is the the inherent failure of it. Take a look at 2 Timothy 3. We're familiar with this passage, but that is, this is actually a latter-day prophecy about love. We're familiar with the warning that Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3. The reason we say it's a prophecy about love is notice the love and just scan down the first five verses of this latter-day prophecy about love and what love will look like in the last days. Notice the love that will be present in the last days and notice the love that will not be present in the last days. There is a love, but it isn't godly love that men will be practicing. These five verses describe what society looks like when godly love has been taken out of the picture. In verse 2, men shall be lovers of their own selves. Do you see why we say that godly love does not teach us that we first need to love ourselves before we can learn to love other people? You hear that today. And Paul warned Timothy that was coming in the last days it would be perilous. People would redefine love to say, I first need to love myself and take care of myself before I can begin to take care of others. 
Godly love, it says, will disappear from society and be replaced by a love of man, by human love. The loves identified in the Latter-day Prophecy, in verse 2, you have the loving of self, and in verse 4, you have the loving of pleasure. But there is no love of God in the last days, is what Paul warns Timothy. And brethren and sisters, as we know, this is not a warning to those outside the community. Paul is warning what will happen to the community of the last days if we lose our ability to love as God intends us, intends that we love. What does a man or a city or a society look like who loves himself and doesn't love God? And that's the description provided in verses 2 through 5. He will become covetous and boasters and proud and blasphemers. Children who learn to love themselves will be disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. It's far easier for those of us who have seen society change in the past 20 years to recognize the stark warning and the reality of 2 Timothy chapter 3. But especially to the young people, to those who haven't seen society change over the last 20 years, it's important that we teach our young people in our Sunday schools and in our CYCs and in our Bible schools and our Bible camps, that we continue to identify for them just how vastly different godly love is from human love. And young people, regardless of the situation, if anyone ever comes along to you in its simplest terms, remember, godly love will always lead a person to righteousness. So if anyone ever comes along to you and asks you to do something or not to do something, or to keep quiet about something, if what they're asking you to do will not lead a person to righteousness, it is not godly love that they're asking you to show. Another contrast of godly love is that it is limitless. It is without bounds. There is nothing I should be unwilling to do for your sake within the parameters of righteousness. Remember we say godly love does not ignore sin in a sinner. It doesn't pretend it isn't there. It doesn't turn a blind eye. So if I come to you and bring wrong doctrine, or if I come to you and bring wrong living, it is not love on your part to ignore that in my life. And you may have to ultimately separate from me if I refuse to change my teaching or my conduct. That is godly love. But if I then come to see the error of my ways, regardless what I have done, and I admit my teaching was wrong, my conduct was unholy, and I come back, with that frame of mind, then the very same godly love that separated from me, the very same godly love, will embrace me with open arms and do all it can to help win me back to righteousness. It's the same godly love that is manifested in both situations because godly love will always seek to return a person to righteousness. A couple uh, other items on the handout. If you look at point number five, there is a special relationship between godly love and obedience. They are presented as being synonymous in Scripture. And again, it's a consistent message in the Old Testament and the New Testament. To love God is to obey God. This is the divine standard for love. It's how God measures our love for him. So that love and obedience are inseparable from God's standpoint. And we won't go through the, uh, the various examples. Other than to point out, be careful when you read the word works, especially in the New Testament. Because it's not always a negative word in Scripture. And we can lose sight of the fact that Scripture speaks of righteous works. And we need to identify when Paul speaks of works, whether he's battling against the false teachers of his day, 
who thought salvation was by works of the flesh, in contrast to the works of obedience that Paul says we need to all uh, strive to fulfill in our life. So the works of the law associated with the Pharisees and then later on with the, the false brethren within the community, the, 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 the uh, works of the flesh that were based on keeping rituals and mutilating the flesh, as he describes it in Galatians, keeping the letter of the law. Paul exposes those are works of the flesh. Men gloried in these, and it was like it was a doctrine to be rejected in the first century. It has no value in checking the flesh. But works arising from faith. Righteous works. Works that are the fruit of righteousness. That which God is intending to develop within us. Those kinds of works are called love. Because it's a reflection of our obedience to him. And, and those kinds of righteous works are what God is seeking to develop in us. There's also an inseparable connection, a special relationship, we call it, in point number six, between faith and love. They share this special relationship. We know from James 2 that we can say we have faith, but if we do not have love, if we do not have works, if we do not have obedience, then we don't have genuine faith. It's a dead faith. We've already seen in Galatians 5 that faith precedes love. Or another way to look at it is love begins with faith. And, and when faith comes first and it precedes our love, then it proves our love is godly love and not human love. We first trust God and then we act by faith and love consistent with his word and that he is pleased with. To give an example of how faith and works, sorry, faith and love work together, turn over to Luke 7. Remember the parable that Christ recounts when he's in Simon the Pharisee's house. He arrives and the woman is weeping and wetting his feet with her tears. And in verse 36 to 38 of chapter 7. We read, one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him, being Jesus. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. And Simon sits there and silently criticizes Jesus, as we know, for failing to see that she was a sinner. Now, when the Pharisee in verse 39, which had bidden Jesus, saw it, the Pharisee spake within himself, saying, This man, Jesus, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And then Christ speaks the parable to Simon. And it is a parable about love and forgiveness. Two people, he says, owes a debt. Owed a debt, sorry. Neither could pay. Both are forgiven. Now, what do you think, Simon? The one forgiven the 50 pence, would they love more or less than the one forgiven the 500 pence? And Simon says, well, I suppose the one forgiven the most would be the most thankful and loved the most. So we pick up at verse 40. And Jesus answering said unto Simon, I have something somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore which of them will love him most. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. So Jesus now will explain this parable and the application of the parable. And it's all about the woman and about Simon. So he says in verse 44, This woman's sins were great, and she was forgiven. And because she was forgiven for her great sins, she loved much. He turned to the woman in verse 44 and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. 
Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with, all, with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. She had come in faith. You see the connection, the special relationship between faith and love. She had come in faith. How do we know that? In verse 50. He said, Jesus said to the woman, thy faith, hath saved thee. Go in peace. So this woman comes into the house by faith. A woman in her situation does not present herself to two men eating at a table and expose herself for the sins that she's committed and put herself in that shameful situation, some would say, unless she is coming by faith to be forgiven of her sins. And Jesus said she came by faith and she loved much. And because of that love, she will be forgiven. The other point to recognize, there are two loves in this section of Scripture. The problem is the one in verse 42 is the second love. The one in verse 47 is the first love. This woman came through the door by faith. And why did she come? Because she loved much. And she was forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ. And she goes out the door in verse 42. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Once she was forgiven... Will, he, will she love the more or the less? And even Simon could see the one forgiven the most will go out the door and love the most because of the forgiveness they have been given. So you see, when God forgives us our sins and we come before him by faith and confess them, Jesus says we will be forgiven. For what purpose? Simply to cleanse our slate so we can go out the door and say, I had my sins forgiven? No. Jesus said, he who is forgiven the most will go out and love the most. So the reason God forgives us our sins when we acknowledge them by faith is having cleansed us from our sins regardless of what they are so that it will bring us to an even greater level of love for him. So he forgives us with an expectation. Like with that woman who went out the door that she would love the most and love even more. That's what God is looking for in our life. That because of his love for us, we will take advantage of the forgiveness we have and the subtle warning to us in this parable and in this lesson, is that if we don't confess our sins, if we don't acknowledge our shortcomings, if we place the blame on everyone else, then there aren't many sins that we're going to look to be forgiven. And if there aren't many sins we're going to look for ourselves to be forgiven, we won't have all that much love for our Heavenly Father when the reality of the situation is we are all great sinners. And we are all in need of his love and his forgiveness so that we will go out and learn to love him even more. Thank you for listening to the Good Christadelphian Talks podcast. Please subscribe for new episodes and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whichever service you are listening from to help people find the show when they search for it. If you enjoyed this talk, share it on social media so other people can find it too. For show notes and links to the talk that you just listened to, visit our show page at anchor.fm slash gct. We want to encourage everyone to share their thoughts from the talk this week on Facebook or Instagram, where we are at Good Christadelphian Talks, or on Twitter, where we are at gct underscore podcast. If you know of a great talk, we want to know about it too. Send a suggestion to goodchristadelphiantalks at gmail.com or message us on any of our social media platforms. Thank you for listening. God bless and talk to you next week.